are going to talk more specifically about the state um, student loan forgiveness um, that was passed this legislative session um, through the organizing and advocacy of um, MA. Um, and then uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about you know why we got the results we got, you know why we ended up with um, you know the student loan proposal, but also why we didn't end up with a lot of other policies that were designed to you know help keep nurses at the bedside. And then finally, um, we're going to kick it over to one of our m and member leaders, John Welch, um, who's going to uh, help lead a brainstorm um, with all of you, because we want to hear your ideas, your thoughts about you know, what else is needed um, you know, at the state level that we can fight for at the Capitol um, to improve the nursing profession in Minnesota um, and you know, address um, the staffing uh, you know, crisis that we're seeing in hospitals. Cool. Next slide. Um, so just some general um, housekeeping rules. Um, we have a lot of people on this um, Zoom meeting, and it's just a regular Zoom meeting, which means, you know, with hundreds of people, you know, on it, there's, you know, a lot of cooperation that's needed to keep things running smoothly. Um, so we're going to, you know, make sure we have time to hear folks' questions. Um, you know, once we're done presenting on the student loan forgiveness. Um, and so if you want to ask a question during that time period, um, just please make sure to write the word stack in the chat. Um, and that will kind of put you in the queue to speak. Um, and then we'll have folks moderating the chat and they, they will call on you in order um, of when you put stack in the chat. So if you're not on stack, if it's not your turn to speak on stack, please keep yourself muted. I think there's some problems with audio, but I think because some of us can hear it, it might be individual problems. Um, if you want to try to problem solve those, Lauren Nielsen is on this call. Sorry, Lauren, I'm volunteering you. Um, and she is our member communication staff so just message her directly to see if you can um, get that resolved and i'll put this in chat too since you might not be able to hear me cool um so you know with that introduction um in mind um before we talk about student loan forgiveness, um, we want to make sure that folks understand the context um, of the actual legislation that you know, has put us in this position to offer student loan forgiveness. Um, so the student loan forgiveness um, funding was you know, part of a much broader piece of legislation um, that you may have heard about you know, throughout the year that m and has been fighting for at the Capitol um, called the Keeping Nurses at the Bedside Act. Um, uh, we also called it CANABA because of its um, acronym. Um, but CANABA was really a, a nurse crafted um, and nurse led bill um, that if passed really would have been sort of a, you know, a much more comprehensive um, piece of legislation to address the, the staffing crisis in hospitals um, and you know, create opportunities for nurses to have more power and say over um, you know, their working conditions. The biggest piece of that bill was um, the creation of staffing committees at individual hospitals um, composed of at least 50% bedside professionals, um, which would have you know, given uh, nurses um, and other healthcare workers real say and real power um, to you know, work together with um, management to create four staffing plans that include maximum patient assignments. Um, and so nurses would have had a say in that process. And so it was a really important provision um, that we were fighting for in addition to student loan forgiveness. We also you know, had anti-retaliation language in the bill um, that would have given additional legal protections to nurses who uh, refuse an unsafe assignment um, because we know that while you know, those, those protections technically do exist already, um, there have been so many instances of retaliation by employers against nurses who do speak out. Um, so we were really fighting for that as well. Um, we were also in the bill 
pushing for you know, workplace violence prevention measures, requiring hospitals to create more detailed plans around how they will address um, with violence in the workplace. Um, and then finally, there was um, the student loan piece um, to um, you know, begin to forgive uh, you know, loan money for nurses in the state um, to you know, create that pathway um, an incentive to, to recruit and retain more uh, registered nurses in hospitals. But in the end, um, we ended up with a different piece of legislation becoming law, um, the Nurse and Patient, Patient Safety Act, or NAPSA. Um, this was um, a compromise um, that was reached after um, the Mayo Clinic, um, as you may have read in the news, um, pressured, uh, you know, uh, the legislature and leadership within the state um, to create an exemption for them, which in turn um, caused us to lose the votes we needed to pass Kanaba into law. Um, and so in that compromise, the core pieces of our safe staffing legislation, legislation that nurses led, wrote, and organized and fought for, for, you know, not just this year, but, you know, decades um, uh, was gutted. And we ended up with still very important pieces such as the workplace violence prevention measures, the student loan forgiveness, which we're all here to um, talk about today. Um, but it's important for everyone to be aware that we're fighting for so much more in addition to this amazing you know, student loan forgiveness program that we're rolling out this year. Um, and you know, it's gonna take you know, a lot more work to truly address you know, the crises facing healthcare and nursing in Minnesota. So with that background in mind, I'm gonna turn it over to Katie, who's going to begin the student loan forgiveness portion and begin with an explanation on the federal student loan forgiveness program. Go ahead, Katie. Thank you, Aaron. I'm Katie Cottonbrook. For those of you who don't know me, I'm one of the lobbyists for you all at the Capitol and I um, was the lead lobbyist on the Keeping the Nurses at the Bedside Act, and then subsequently NAPSA, or the Nurse and, Safe, Nurse and Patient Safety Act. Um, so I am here to help you if you have questions or concerns about that legislation, but I just wanted to quickly get into some of the federal changes that we've seen with the student loan program, since many of you are eligible for the Public Student Loan Forgiveness Program. Um, so just a Brief overview of that program. You have to be employed by the government or a qualifying nonprofit, which nonprofit hospitals in Minnesota should count for eligibility into that program. You have to work full time, which according to federal rules is about 30 hours a week. Um, and then you have to have direct loans or consolidate your loans into direct loans so that you have a federal loan servicer. These are things that have been kind of complicated in the past and the Biden administration has been working with individuals. So if you're not certain that your loans qualify and you haven't previously registered for this program, I think now is a really great time to see if you are eligible. Um, one of the big changes is that in order to be eligible for the public student loan forgiveness program, you needed to be enrolled into an income driven repayment plan the Biden administration has reviewed the rules and determined that if you're in a payment plan, so a standard payment plan or an income-driven repayment plan, that you should also be eligible for student loan forgiveness and you should work with your servicer to find the one that best fits your income and your needs. And then in order to hit the 10-year loan forgiveness, you have to make 120 qualifying payments during that time. And sometimes your payment may be zero if there was a time in between school or getting a nursing degree or if you're just starting or you had a lower paying job that maybe made it more challenging for you to pay your loans. You may have payments that counted, even though you weren't making any dollar amount to that payment. And I'm not an expert, but I've done this work a little bit. So if you have any questions on this, you can always reach out to me and I'll have my contact information at the end of this as well. And this is just a quick overview of the loans that are eligible for the federal program. Um, so generally, if you took out loans from a private lender, or if you have the 
two types of loans they mentioned here, the federal Perkins loan or the federal family education loan. They may not be eligible, but again, you should talk with your loan servicer to determine what your options are or like Lutheran Social Services in Minnesota provides free counseling for these types of things too, if you have questions. And then there have been big changes under the Biden administration. And so we know that he had proposed that folks would get $10,000 or $20,000 just for giving off the top um, if they were eligible. Unfortunately, the Supreme Court struck that down. They've now entered into new rules for the loan forgiveness program. And it can end up saving even more money than just that direct forgiveness would have saved us. Um, and so what you'll see under the new rules with this program is that many folks will see lower monthly payments. Instead of it being 10% of your monthly income, the cheapest plan will now only ask for a 5% payment of your income, and that's determined um, via tax things that I am definitely not an expert on, but it's not your gross income. It's a income after deductions. And that amount of non-discretionary income has changed. So it now is more forgiving than what you would have seen when you applied for an income-driven repayment plan before. And for any individual who took out $12,000 or less of student loans and they paid for 10 years, your balance will be forgiven regardless um, of how much you still owe. And if you're in current payment, even if your payment is zero, you will see that your interest isn't accumulating. I know with my student loans, what I saw is I paid every single month and I just saw my bill get bigger and bigger and bigger for my balance um, because of that interest that was tacked on. So now if you're in an income-driven repayment plan or a standard payment plan with your federal loan servicer, you shouldn't see increased interest as long as you're in repayment. Um, and so for you all as registered nurses, we just wanna let you know you're probably eligible for this program because we work at a nonprofit hospital if you have student loan debt. And one of the big changes is that in order to get some of the changes that the Biden administration is proposing, you'll want to ensure that you're in the income-driven repayment plan that is currently called Repayee. And this was a program option that was put in during the Obama administration. And if you're in that, or if you choose to enroll into what is called the SAVE plan, you will be eligible for all of the changes that are happening and the lower student loan payments, as well as some of the forgiveness options that have happened with the Biden administration. So again, you wanna talk with your federal student loan servicer, make sure you're in repay now, or that you enroll into the SAVE program because the SAVE program is where you'll see a lot of the different benefits that I just talked about. And I'm gonna um, switch it over to the Minnesota Department of Health staff, Elizabeth, for a moment, in a moment, but just wanna open it up and see if anyone has questions. And again, um, if you have questions, we ask that you please put yourself on staff in the chat and stay muted unless we call on you. And we'll follow the staff in the chat for individuals who put themselves on staff. And I see that Jennifer is on staff right now. Hi, um, I had just a couple questions. Um, so um, payments were deferred during the pandemic uh, with no interest. Do those payments count towards the 120 payments? I did um, apply and got a response that they did. I just wanna make sure. And then, um, so if we do these income driven repayment plans, like the repay or save plan, then we're still eligible for the loan forgiveness. Is that my understanding? Cause I've just been afraid to switch anything for fear that if I switch what I'm doing, that I'll be ineligible. <laughs> so, and somebody else had a question too, in the stack, which I'm also wondering, um, uh, if 
when we were deferred directly out of nursing school, like I think I deferred for the first like four months or so, do, does that count towards it or not? So yeah, yes, during the pandemic deferral period, you should any payment that you made during that time should count to the 120 payments. No, if you're in a deferral for any other reason is my understanding, but you should always check with your student loan servicer, or if you're having troubles working with them, calling your congressional offices so they can make sure that they get you the right answer for your um, direct information in your account. And you're eligible for the public student loan forgiveness as long as you're in one of the income-driven repayment plans or a standard. So if you switch to the repayee or the save, you st should definitely be eligible for the 120-month loan forgiveness. And Callie, you're on staff next. Hi. Yeah, my question was related to the, the full time work aspect of it. I've worked 24 hours a week since I started um, as a nurse about seven years ago. And so I'm just wondering um, what the eligibility, how that might be affected by, um, yeah, just how that would affect my eligibility for this program. So unfortunately, if you work approximately 24 hours, um, week, you wouldn't be eligible. If you found that consistently you're picking up more shifts that put you over your FTE, then you can work with your employer or if you're struggling with your congressional office um, to get those hours counted, but you have to work at least 30 hours a week, unfortunately. And then there's a 45 week window in the um, eligibility criteria. So it's not that you have to for 52 weeks work 30 hours, but as long as you get that 45 hours or that 45 weeks, then you should be okay. So Callie, I'm nervous you might not be eligible. Ashley, you're on staff next. Hi, uh, so my question kind of stems off of the last question in, so like the first few years I was a nurse, I was part-time. Um, so I was a 0.6 FTE. Uh, but current, the last probably five years now, I have been full time. So I meet that 30. Does my counting start once I started full time or just now that I am and have been full time? It goes. Generally, it's only the weeks of if you hit 45 weeks a year at 30 hours. So the time when you started, you may not be eligible for that loan forgiveness, but once you hit the full-time equivalent, you should be eligible. But if you can, again, show employment records that you worked more than what your FTE was, it's worth fighting to see if you can get that eligibility in. Gail? Okay, so my question is answered. So thank you. Thanks, Gail. And I think we answered the full-time equivalent, 30 hours. And Akila messaged and she said, what if you qualify now at 30 hours but drop FTE later? If you're not working 30 hours or more a week, then your payments don't count as qualified payments. Um, Prince, you asked a question and I'm not sure I understand it. Would you be able to come up with mute and explain what your question is? Yeah, um, you said that to qualify, you have to be working 30 hours a week. Um, are you talking about the average, yearly average, or the past three years, or from now moving forward? So for the Federal Student Loan Forgiveness Program, any year, that you can show that you worked on average 30 or more hours a week and you made payments towards your student loans, you should be eligible for the federal program. Does that answer your question? So it can yes. be any time that you've had the student loans in the past or oh. future. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Kaylee? Yeah, thank you. Um, 
So in the past, I've worked over 30 hours a week, but the past two years, I'm only 24 hours a week. Will, what, is there any benefit to me increasing my FTE now for if I do qualify? Or is there, does that not make sense to do at this point? It really depends on how much student loan debt you have and how much you need that forgiveness. But if you are able to raise your FTE and qualify for the program, if you can show from your employer that you have that 30 hour FTE or 30 hours average employment, you should be okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, Jennifer, I'm not certain I'm qualified to answer the maternity leave question, but you, my understanding is you should be eligible for the federal program because you have qualifying employment and you're just taking leave, which is guaranteed through the federal FMLA Act, um, but you would want to check maybe with your congressional office on that one. So Senator Klobuchar, Senator Tina Smith, or whomever is your congressional member in the House, and they'd be able to get that answer. I know sometimes it's hard to go to your um, loan servicer to get the correct answer and a quick answer sometimes, but you can just send an email to your congressional members and they could get that answered for you. Kaylin? Oh, sorry. 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 Just so just to clarify, um, like I already brought like the sheet in to my manager. My manager signed it. I got paperwork back um saying like these are the amount of payments that I get credit for. Is there like if my manager has already signed off, is there like an auditing system that they do? Because it just seems like there was a signature. And so now like that maternity leave is in the past. So if I already have a signature and a manager already said it's okay, then I should be fine, correct? I okay. think I'm pretty sure, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Kaylin? Hey, yeah, so when our loans, um, if we're in a deferment period, like let's say I go back to school and I'm not paying for loans at the time, um, post-graduation when you're in a period of repayment again, obviously the Payments, if you made any during deferment, those do not count towards the 120. But I'm assuming afterwards, <clears throat> when you're in a repayment plan again, those would count. And then can you just clarify how much, I'm just confused about how much money um, they will actually like forgive us for. Was it as long as it's less than 12,000 or am I interpreting that incorrectly? So in the first part, yes, you should be good. Um, the second part, you have to make 120 qualifying payments. And whatever your loan debt is after that, if you work in a nonprofit and qualify for this program, the rest of your debt is forgiven. The changes under the Biden administration are for even people who don't work in nonprofits and aren't eligible for the public student loan forgiveness program. If they have 10 years of qualifying payments and they only took out 12,000 or less, then they should be forgiven. So if you worked, for example, at a for-profit hospital for 10 years and you didn't have a lot of debt, um, you should be eligible for that. Or if you switched over and you have four years of public student loan forgiveness or to Katie's question, if you worked at a CNA and it wasn't necessarily a nonprofit organization, all of those years will count. To have your hours as a CNA count, you just have to match the government agent, government worker or nonprofit worker, and then you should be eligible for forgiveness for that. And um, I know there are a lot of questions. I wanna get to the MDH part of this since Elizabeth was very kind to spend the evening with us, and I'm sure there will be a lot of questions there so I'm gonna take Alexander's and then if anyone else wants to just send me your questions, I will get back to you when we have a moment, sorry. Hi, I just wanted to uh, maybe perhaps clarify. So what uh, was added to this already kind of established program, the public forgiveness, which was established in 2007. So the rules about 120 payments, it was there a long time ago. Uh, 30 hours, you know, it's been there for a long time ago. 
Uh, so what did this legislation change uh, as far as that loan forgiveness for nurses? So we'll get into the loan forgiveness for registered nurses from the Nurse and Patient Safety Act next. That's with the state level. With the federal government loan forgiveness changes under the Biden administration, it wasn't legislation, it was rulemaking. Um, and so this may be contentious and go to the courts. But what you'll see is that instead of 10% of your income for your student loan forgiveness payment, it'll be 5% of your income. You'll have a lower amount of your total income considered, and there are easier loan forgiveness options. Okay, so those are the main changes basically that were added to the program. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, 0.75 should qualify you for loan forgiveness. Um, private loans cannot be forgiven for the federal loans, but they may be eligible for the state program. We'll talk to Elizabeth with that next. Um, Kelsey, will you send me your question? And everyone else, I'm going to message you, um, but turn it over to Elizabeth to get into the state side program that was part of the Nurse and Patient Safety Act. So give me one second to uh, change over PowerPoints, and we will um, switch it over to Elizabeth. And Elizabeth, do you want to just start an introduction of who you are? And I'm sharing my screen now. Sure. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm Elizabeth Fenske. I am the program administrator for the loan forgiveness program here in the state. Um, prior to MDH, I did work in student financial aid for about 10 years. So I do have a background in financial aid, loans, stuff like that. So if um, there's any questions on that, I'd be happy to try to answer those as well. Um, but yeah, I wanted to just share information. We've been getting a lot of interest and questions about the new program for hospital nurses. So I'm happy to be here to kind of clarify and answer any questions about the program. So if you wanna to go to the next slide, please, Katie. Um, so just a little bit of background about this program. Um, it has been in state statute since um, the 1990s. And the trend has been that um, as time goes on, more professions are added and more money is added. So that's the trend that we're seeing, um, which is great because then we can um, expand our program and help a lot more healthcare professionals. Um, if you want to go to the next slide. And as Erin mentioned, this um, the new piece with the hospital nurses was part of the Nurse and Patient Safety Act that was passed this past session. Um, so I do have a link if just to the statute if anyone wants to click on that later. I believe Katie will be sending the PowerPoint or making it available. So all the links will be active. Um, if you want to go to the next slide. Um, this slide just shows um, all of the current eligible professions. So I'm highlighting the hospital nurses, um, but I did want to also let people know that we do have other professions that are eligible. So if you know other people or um, you're working with other people, you can let them know. Um, the hospital nurse application is open now and for the other professions that application is going to be open in November, November 1. So you can um, let people know that. Also, if you're a nurse who's not working in a hospital, we have um, eligibility for nurses in long-term care. We have eligibility for public health nurses. So that would be an RN with the public health certificate. And we also have nurse faculty. So that would be someone with an RN degree who's teaching at a post-secondary institution in Minnesota. And then we also have the um, advanced practice nurses. So I wanted to mention those. If you want to go to the next slide. 
Okay, so the questions that we're getting a lot right now are just around eligibility. And I think that was kind of reflected in the questions that you guys had for Katie about the federal um, program as well. So um, I'll try to clarify those. Um, for our program, you have to be employed and working in a hospital in Minnesota, and it cannot be a for-profit hospital. So um, the majority of hospitals in Minnesota are going to be either public or nonprofit. There's just a, a small handful that are for-profit. So most people will be eligible in that regard. Um, must be licensed and working as an RN by March 31st of next year. Um, so if you're still um, working on getting that license or looking for a job you have until then, you can still apply now. You just have to have that secured before March 31st. Um, another big requirement is you must be working in direct patient care. Um, and I'll talk more about that later, but what that basically means is if you are a person who is more of a supervisor or you're working more on like a policy side or you're working with the admin side of the hospital, um, you would not be eligible. So it's really directed to those who are um, working at the bedside in the hospitals. And then uh, another question that we have been getting um, is because hospitals are so big and they have so many departments, um, it's a little tricky to say just if you're in a hospital, you're, you're eligible. So we're pointing out that this excludes outpatient surgical center RNs, and then also those who are working in clinics that are associated with the hospital. So that's um, a question that we've been getting a lot. Like I work in such and such a clinic, it's on the campus of the hospital, uh, what, am I eligible? And the answer to that is no. Um, I think if you go to the next slide. All right, this is another um, point of confusion. And I think this just stemmed from how the wording was in the um, program information notice. So um, if you're selected for our program, we will ask you to sign a service contract that says you will be working as a hospital nurse for at least the next two years or the next four years. So this does not mean that you have to have already been working as a hospital nurse for two years or four years. It has nothing to do with past work. This is a future commitment that you would be um, signing up for. So. For example, um, when we are done with the whole process of the application, reviews, selection, after that time, we're gonna ask you to sign a contract. It'll have a start date of sometime in March. So from March date forward, that's when we begin counting the two or four years. So it's not retroactive. And again, um, the 30 hour per week question, um, we are a little bit more flexible than the public service loan forgiveness. So um, what we're asking is 30 hours per week for at least 45 weeks per year. And this is an average. So for example, if you are a person that works a 0.7 and you pick up overtime on a regular basis and you expect to do that for the next two to four years, yes, you are eligible. If you are a person who works 28 hours one week and 32 hours the next week, yes, you are eligible. So a little bit more flexible. Um, the, the hours per year, it works out to a little over 1300 hours per year. Um, so again, yes, you are eligible if your hours vary from week to week, but you still are getting that average, yes, please apply. Um, let's see, so for the funding for the award, the current award for a four-year commitment is $24,000. So that means a two-year commitment would be $12,000.
So um, how we determine is that is if you are a person who has a debt of let's say $10,000, we would just sign a commitment of two years because you're not gonna get money for year three and four. So we're just gonna do a two year for you. If you're a person who has $30,000 in debt, then we're gonna, you're gonna probably wanna do the four year commitment during those four years, if at any time you do not want years three and four, you can opt out of that, but we would set it up to begin with as a four-year commitment and then go down from there if that's what you would like to do. Um, the size of the award is determined using 15% of the average debt in the field. So from our data, we determined that the average debt for an RN is $40,000. So that's where we got our $6,000 per year award. And I'll also point out that um, the amount that you would be awarded cannot exceed what you owe in student loan debt. So for example, if going back to the $10,000 debt of a person, they would not get a $12,000 award for two years, they would get a $10,000 award for two years. So that amount cannot exceed the debt that you owe. Um, we can go to the next slide. Yep. Okay. So this just shows just plain and simple year one at the beginning of the year. If you start in March, in March, we're going to give you $6,000. Next March, when we get your paperwork, which I'll talk about later, we're going to give you the next $6,000 and so on and so forth. So it's not all at once. It's once per year and it's at the beginning of your contract year. Can go to the next slide, please. Um, so annual reporting. So um, like I said, each year we're gonna give you the payment at the beginning of the year. And then come February, if you start in March, come February, we're gonna ask that you have your employer verify your work from that past year. And we're also gonna ask for a documentation that you paid that $6,000 to your student loan servicer. Um, so when you make those payments, keep a document. A lot of times um, loans are sold or transferred to different lenders and that can be a source of frustration for our participants, then they lose that payment history. So when you make the payment, send it on in or keep it in a safe spot. And then at the end of that contract year in February, we're gonna ask for that information and we're gonna ask for that verification of your work and the work hours. And then once we get that, um, we will release the second payment. And then we're gonna do that each year of the four years. Um, a lot can happen during one year. so. Some things I wanna point out is um, you can change jobs, you can change hospitals. So you can change, um, you can switch jobs as long as the job is still eligible. Like you're still an RN, you're still in direct patient care, maybe you just switch departments. Um, you can also, if you move, you can switch to a different hospital as long as that's a nonprofit or a public hospital. But you do need to let us know at the time that you're changing. Um, you can even let us know ahead of time and we can double check that yes, that would be eligible. And then you're gonna wanna let us know when that changes because we are going to need information from your current employer that you'll be leaving and then also your new employer. So um, just the takeaway from that bullet point is just keep in contact with us. A year is a long time, a lot of things happen and um, we just ask that you let us know those changes. So you can go to the next slide, please. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, yes, okay, so this just shows which loans are eligible for our program. So. Um, we have the federal loan subsidized, unsubsidized, I grab plus. Parent plus is not eligible. So if your parent took out a loan for you, that would not be eligible. Um, private student loans are eligible. Private 
loans that are personal loans are not eligible. Also not eligible would be a loan that is in a default status. And then personal loans, like I mentioned, and then student loans consolidated with non-student loans, or I had a question come up. Um, it was a parent that had consolidated a parent plus loan with their own loans. And unfortunately that makes those loans ineligible. So if it's in consolidated with a loan that would not be eligible, um, then those are not gonna be counted. And we are requiring a debt of at least $6,000 just because um, if it's less than $6,000, we have seen in the past that if you don't have a year's worth of debt that um, it can hurt the retention of that person in the program, it's not worth it for them to continue in the program and they drop out and then that money that could have gone to somebody else who would have stayed. Uh, next slide, please. Um, temporary suspension of service. So most commonly this is uh, maternity leave or paternity leave. Um, like I said earlier, a year is a long time. A lot of things can happen. Um, you may be taking a maternity leave or paternity leave and that is fine. Again, you'll let us know. You'll let us know the dates. And then what will happen is we will extend your contract year by that same amount of weeks or months that you are off on your leave. So I have an example. If your contract begins March 1 and ends February 28th, that's the contract year. If you took a three month leave during that time, your new contract end date would be June 1. And then your new con, the next contract year would be starting June 2. So then it would be June to June instead of March to February. So we just extend that end date for all the um, remaining years that you um, by the uh, same amount of time that you were on leave. So I hope that was clear, but I'm happy to take questions on that um, at the end. Um, next slide, please. Okay, like I said, this is a contract that you're gonna be signing with the state of Minnesota. So um, it's a legal document. You are saying that you are going to be working in this um, eligible profession, you are going to be paying the money toward your student loan. If you do not do that, or if you move out of state, if you cease practicing as a nurse altogether, we're going to ask for that money back. Um, if you, if this happens during year two, we're gonna ask for year one and year two back. If it happens during year three, we're gonna ask for one, two, three. If it happens in year four, it's everything. We need everything back. Um, there's an interest rate that comes into play if you are going to be paying back on a monthly basis. So we do have an option. You can do a lump sum payment, pay everything back in one lump sum. There'd be no interest added. If you choose to do the two year monthly payment plan, there is a interest rate added, and currently that interest rate is 7.5%. Um, so just something to keep in mind um, that it's a contract. If you break it, you will be paying the funds back. Uh, next slide, please. All right. So... A lot of you may have already started the online application, which is great. We've had a great response to people starting that. Um, some of the pieces that we're asking for is your resume, student loan statements, and then two letters of reference. So um, one thing to point out is that uh, nurses will tend to have a lot of the same educational experience. So to set yourself apart, you can talk about your volunteer work. You can talk about your leadership experiences, your specialized trainings, um, go into detail on your work history, um, make it as robust as possible so that when the community reviewers are looking at your application, they have no question as to what you've been doing um, or what your strengths are. Um, student loan statements is pretty 
easy to go to your online student account and print off a balance, a statement. Um, a lot of times people will send in like the mortgage verification, which is um, a pretty easy one page document that a lot of student loan servicers will just have. Um, you can print, you don't need to ask them for anything. Um, and then two references, one must be a supervisor. So um, just to clarify, a charge nurse would be an eligible um, reference as a supervisor. And then um, some that would not be eligible would be a peer who is like on the same um, level as you or somebody that works under you. So it can't be somebody that you actually supervise. Um, another example of someone who would be a good reference would maybe be if you had a connection with a professor from your nursing program or a preceptor or um, a, a supervisor at a previous job. I mean, you want one of at least one of the references from your current employer, um, but the other one is is um, up to you and you can actually upload three references. Um, you need to, um, but you can have three. Next slide, please. All right, so this goes into the essay. Last week, we had um, sent out an email to those of you who had already started an application um, explaining that we did make a small change to this portion of the application. So what I'm showing here is the current essay prompts. Um, if you already wrote your essay with the previous prompts, that is totally fine. You do not need to change it. Um, but you can also use the new prompts. And again, this is your chance to set yourself apart from other applicants. Um, tell us how you're connected to the community. If you're working in rural Minnesota, um, how are you connected to that rural place so that our reviewers have confidence that you're not going to change jobs and go to an urban area that might not need as much help? Um, things like that. And then explain why you care about working in the hospital setting and why you would like to continue working there. Um, why, what, is, what is your passion for that? What, what makes you stay? Um, again, just kind of make it personal. Um, just show, show your passion and show, show how you have impacted people or how they have impacted you. Um, and then the third bullet point is show, um, excuse me, share how your experiences will impact healthcare outcomes. Um, so again, um, did you develop a special program for your department? Um, what was the impact of that? Was it a great success? And we'd love to hear that. So um, yeah, just to reiterate, I mean, you wanna make it personal. You don't wanna, it's not a, um, a school paper. It's an essay about you and what you're doing in your job, why you love it. Um, Next slide, please. All right, so this is just a little timeline. So um, application is open now. It will close on October 6th. Um, again, you must be fully licensed and working by March 31st of next year. We're gonna let everybody know the decisions, um, if you were accepted or not in January or February, we're gonna do that by email. And not all who apply will be selected. So the legislature has given us two years of funding. Um, so if you are not selected this year, you are welcome to reapply next year and see if you are selected at that time. Um, it's a competitive review process. So we have, um, we will have, um, folks from the healthcare community, we're gonna have professors or preceptors or 
retired RNs. We're going to ask them to volunteer their time to review the applications and score, and they are the ones who are going to be making the award recommendations, not MDH. So it's a group review. Um, there's two to three people on each review panel, and they will each review a handful of people. And then, um, so we'll have multiple groups reviewing, um, and then they're gonna make the award recommendations based on the scoring of your resume, your essay, your references, um, things like that. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this slide just points out that this is not the only program available. Um, it's new, but we also have in our office, we also have the Minnesota State Loan Repayment Program, which we affectionately call SLURP. Um, SLURP is going to be open in September. And if you are an RN um, who is not working in a hospital, but you are working in a location that is a health professional shortage area, um, you are able to apply in September for the SLURP program. And there is a link there that you can type in your worksite address to see if it is in a health professional shortage area. And it will tell you um, when you put your address in, your work address. Um, and then there's a few federal programs. Um, obviously, they're not done in our office, but just to share some information, um, they're from HRSA. Um, so there is uh, the National Health Service Corps Loan Repayment Program, and then there's also the Nurse Corps Loan Repayment Program. So I've provided links to both of those programs. One thing I'll note is you can apply to any and all of these programs, but you can only participate in one at a time. So if you were selected for our program and for a federal program, you would need to choose which one you are going to participate in. Now, the exception to that is the public service loan forgiveness. You can do public service loan forgiveness and our program concurrently. The, the big issue with that is, like I was saying earlier, you need to prove that you're paying that $6,000 towards your loan. So if during that time your loans are forgiven and you are unable to apply that to your uh, to your student loans because they had already been forgiven, then we're going to ask for that money back. But we're also going to ask that you keep the service portion of your contract. So if you um, were able to pay $4,000 out of the $6,000 and then it got forgiven, we're going to ask for the $2,000 back and that you continue with the service portion of your contract. If for any reason you don't want to continue with the service portion of your contract, we're going to ask for the total funds back that we had given you. So you can do both, um, but you also have to make sure that you're applying those funds. Um, and if not, we're gonna we're gonna ask for that money back. Um, I will say too that um, since we do give a lump sum at the beginning of each contract year. You can take that lump sum and prepay on a public service loan forgiveness for up to 12 months. So you'd want to contact your servicer, which is typically Moila, and let them know that you're paying, you're prepaying for the 12 months. Um, and then you can give them that lump sum. And then you don't have to worry about your monthly payments for the next 12 months. And you don't have to worry about them not counting towards the public service loan forgiveness. Otherwise, what you can do is you can make monthly payments. Um, as long as those monthly payments add up to the $6,000 that we gave you at the beginning of the contract year by the end of that contract year. Um, and I think that's my last slide. My last slide is just my contact information. Um, so if your question, if we don't get to your question now, which I'm happy to take questions now, you can email us or give me a call. That's my phone number. We have a um, uh, like a general email box, and then I have my personal email and phone number there. I'm happy to take questions.
Lauren, are you ready to read the section? Sorry. Yeah, sorry. I was having an audio issue for a second. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, just give me one moment here. Um, we do have a few people on stack um, with questions in the chat. So I think our first person was uh, Crystal. Crystal uh, Dialinkar. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correct. Yeah, yeah, actually, that's probably the only time in my life someone got it off the first try. So <laughs> um, yeah, I, I had asked uh, for current nursing students um, who won't be licensed by March 31st. Do you know if there's kind of hope for a similar program in the future um, or there might be opportunities? I know that might be a kind of an impossible question to answer, but. Um, yes, well, we did get funding for two years. So two application cycles. So we will have at least one more application open and it will likely be around the same time next year. Um, we don't have an exact date and that can change. So I would just keep an eye on the website and we will um, send an email, you know, including MNA when that is going to be opening, but we will have at least one other application cycle for this um, this hospital nurse program. Yes. Amazing. Thank you so much. All right. Next, we have Kayla Wimmer. Kayla, are you still on to ask your question? All right, I'm not hearing Kayla, so I will um, go on to the next person, uh, Chris Rubish. Uh, thanks. Um, thanks for the presentation. I just um, think that I heard two competing numbers when you were talking about the uh, average uh, hours per week worked versus the like total hours in a year. And being a nurse who's potentially on the cusp of that. And if I don't meet the requirements, I could end up owing significantly more. Um, I'm really concerned about applying. And so if you could just make it more clear as to how many hours I have to work to qualify, um, sure. that, that, that would be helpful. Yeah, it's a 30 hour a week average for 45 weeks out of the year. So that's 1,000 for 45 weeks of the year. Correct. Okay. Okay. Yep. So it's and, about I want to say thirteen fifty. Okay. Oh, and, and and we have to prove that at the end of the year, right? Is that correct? Correct. Your employer okay. is going to have to sign and verify that those hours were worked. Correct. Okay. Is mm -hmm. is is there? Sorry, I have two related follow ups. So is there a distinction? Um, I'm, I'm not sure that there's a distinction on my time card for, because you, you talked about bedside care versus um, like practice council meetings or, you know, things that I'm getting paid for, but aren't bedside care. How, mm -hmm. how is that um, verified or is there a process for verifying that? Um, I guess if you're concerned about that, I would maybe, maybe keep a separate spreadsheet for yourself that says, you know, this week I worked. 25 hours bedside, five hours, you know, process improvement, sure. something like that. And then if there's a question when your employer comes to sign the verification and they're thinking, I don't know if this person, you know, did that much direct care, you can hit, well, I've been keeping this spreadsheet just so you know, and these are the sure. hours that we work in. I think that would be a safe, a safe bet. Got it. That makes sense. Uh, and then my, my last follow-up was, um, is there any allotment or determination around like sick time or you know anything is that counting towards it do I have to work extra if I'm sick hmm. yeah um because we are using the 45 weeks out of the year instead of the full 52 weeks per year we feel that that's um, built into the program itself and we don't okay. need to count out sick days okay unless it's like a sick leave of absence 
then it goes mm -hmm. back to the suspension of the contract and then adding those weeks or months at the end of the, at the end. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right, the next question is Alexander Volishin. Yeah, I just had a quick question. So uh, it was more related to um, like the particular uh, student loan, uh, like for example, if you're going to maybe MP school, would this kind of loan qualify or it has to be um, only specific for RN program? It's for the RN program and then any undergrad work that would have led up to that program. So if this, and thank you for this question, because this is a question that we've been getting um, is something like, I'm currently an RN, but I'm going to, you know, I want to become a, an NP. Um, then you would want to think and decide, well, do I want to apply now as an RN or do I want to wait and apply as an advanced practice um, professional, um, which is part of our regular cycle? Um, so depending on, you know, the timing of when you expect to get an advanced practice degree, you may want to wait and have that, have those loans counted towards an application in advanced practice instead of the application for hospital nurses. But if one chooses to do um, like, you know, being an RN, going to school, let's say to become an P, that still would qualify, right? And become, I, I didn't hear the- Yeah, and so like in this case, so if one decides just to go to uh, an P program while they're working as RN, mm -hmm. right? and then that they would like to perhaps apply for this program, so mm -hmm. this qualifies still? No, the loans for the NP program would not qualify unless you're applying as an advanced practice uh, provider, then they would qualify. But if you're applying and accepted as an RN, then just the RN loans and previous work that counted leading up to the RN degree would be eligible. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right, next we have Brittany Reed. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Um, so first I'll lead with, is there a maximum amount of applicants that are granted this award? Yes. So we got just over $10 million for the two years. Um, so we plan to award just over 200 people in this application cycle, and then another 200 in the second year. Okay. Great, thank you. And then one more question. Um, so the 12,000 or the 24,000 that would be granted, mm -hmm. when would, would, I know you're like informing people January and February of this upcoming year. Um, mm -hmm. What would those go into effect technically? When would you receive a payment? Yes. Your, yeah, um, it will be when your contract begins. So um, we're estimated that a contract will begin in March. And so in March, you will receive the first $6,000 payment. Okay. That's it. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. All right, next we have a question from Megan Stemper. I think I'm good now. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, next, uh, Tiffany Kostrowski. I'm just wondering if the link was going to be fixed. Um, the link doesn't seem to be working on the website. Yeah, thanks for apply. Me. Thanks for mentioning that. I forgot to mention that there's a parenthesis at the end of the link. If you delete that parenthesis, you should be able to link. Um, we're working on getting it updated, but that's the fix for now is just to delete that last parenthesis. All right, and next we have Rebecca Jansen. Hey, this is actually Rebecca Jansen's wife, her husband, uh, because she's working. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, but so we are, um, I guess, considering uh, a, ha having a child at some point uh, in the next year. And uh, we're concerned if, if we apply, that would breach the contract if she takes her 12 weeks off. Uh, and just wondering how that how that all pans out. 
Yep, we have, um, it's okay to suspend the contract for a maternity leave. So what we would do in that case is we would suspend the contract for the 12 weeks or whatever it is. And then we would add that 12 weeks to the end of the contract year. So instead of being March to February, it would be March to, what did I say earlier? Like something like June. Okay. Yeah, so it's totally fine. Um, the key is just letting us know so that um, in February, we're not asking you for that when the hours won't be complete, just um, letting us know. Okay. And then the other question is, if you um, are injured during your, say you get a four-year contract, um, mm -hmm. would you be eligible, if, or would you have to pay all that money back if you're no longer allowed to practice as a nurse because you're injured? If you are, if you have a, it's kind of the same with like a, a federal loan. Like if you're disabled and you no longer have gainful employment um, and you have a doctor's note that is telling us that, then we will work with you to um, release you from the contract. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, and then a uh, question from Prince. Yes, um, I was just wondering about the 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 repayment, the the hundred and twenty month payments. Um, if you're in school, for example, you are in you you are in a in school deferment. So, uh, and and also when COVID came the government put a, a stop to all the payments. So does that all count against you or? Okay, so you're asking about the public service loan forgiveness from the federal government, which is not my program, but I'm happy to answer the question. Um, if you're in an in-school deferment, um, those payments, if you make any payments during that time, those are not counted. Um, during the pandemic deferment, those zero dollar payments were counted towards public service loan forgiveness. If you're in a grace period after school, those are not counted. Um, you can always contact your loan servicer and ask them to take you out of a grace or deferment um, so that you can start paying sooner and start adding up those 120 payments quicker. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right, uh, next we have uh, Sabrina Borders Beach. My question uh, was just in regards to the department that you're in. So if we're in an infusion department in the hospital, uh, we are part of the MNA union and then we do get floated to other floors. I don't know if this would still count. If you're working in the hospital, it's yeah, it's fine. You, you um you would still qualify. The, the parts that wouldn't qualify is if you are in a clinic within the hospital or in the hospital complex or an outpatient surgery center, those would not qualify. Okay, perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. Next on stack is uh, Ashley Yost. All right, my question relates to um, going to NP school. Um, I am interested in applying for this um, RN forgiveness program for my RN, um, my bachelor's and my associates. Uh, mm -hmm. I have at I have 18,000 in student loans, so I would think it would be a three-year commitment if I understand correctly. And my, my nursing program, or my, um, NP program is three years also. Does that hurt me if I apply um, since I am going to school? Does that affect it at all? Um, I, I'm not interested in um, doing the advanced practice portion because I, I'm not going to take out any loans during my, um, my doctorate here. Okay. So it would just be my undergrad stuff. First thing to note is we do not have a three-year option. We have a two-year option or a four-year option. 
There's no okay. one year option. There's no three year option. Um, so if you are in um, a current RN working and also going to school, that is fine as long as you're able to maintain the 30 hours a week in average. Um, also, if you were to graduate and begin working as an NP, that would not be okay because you're under contract as an RN. Is that, does that answer your question? Um, kind of. Um, I understand the, you know, like you have to fulfill your commitment before you start practicing as an NP. And I think the times would be fine. Um, I may have a month or two that I would just stay at RN before taking an MP job. Um, does it does it affect the application process though? Like are it, would it hurt my application that I'm going to school? You know, because it is a competitive I see. application. Okay. Yeah, I mean, definitely you can say that in your application, but I'd also recommend that you make it clear that you plan to continue working as an RN until, you know, your commitment would be over. So, so that it's very clear to the folks that are going to be reading your application that you don't plan on defaulting in the middle of a contract. Perfect, thank you. Okay, you're welcome. All right, um, then other questions? Sorry if I miss anyone, I'm just uh, trying to make sure we get to those on stack here. I think uh, John Welsh, were you on stack next? Yes, Lauren, thank you. I, I was stacked and then I unstacked and now I stacked again. <laughs> Elizabeth, I really appreciate this uh, presentation, really, really helpful. I just had a question. You said 200 applicants are going to be approved. I mean, we have $10 million. If they get $6,000 a piece, that's a million. Two years is 2.4 million. Uh, can you, 200 sure. seems low. Yeah, um, it, it'll, it's about $5 million per application cycle. So for this application cycle, it's about $5 million that we're splitting up um, the 200 person number comes at a full award. So we're taking 200 divided by 24,000 and uh, excuse me, 5 million divided by the 24,000. That's where we're getting the 200 number. Does that make more sense? Yes. So, okay. So you are, so this would be for the people doing it for four years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's just um, like a starting point. Like, of course, we're going to have people that we know their debt is not over $12,000. So they're going to be a two year. So sure. that will um, increase the amount of awardees. Um, but just as a starting point or like a talking point, it's going to be around 200. And even though the funding is for the two year cycle, we can make mm -hmm. a commitment for the four years. Then. Correct. Yep. Okay. Yep. You. you don't need to reapply. Yep. All right, I think um, I got everyone on. Oh, we have one more on stack and um, Megan Hoffer. Hi, um, I apologize. I, I know that you addressed this right at the end of what you were saying before you open up for questions, um, but I just didn't quite catch it. So you were talking about um, if we're doing PSLF as well as this program and we could spread like our $6,000 out um, per year for this program and then use that to apply towards our um, qualifying payments uh, uh, for the PS PSLF program, is that correct? Yeah, so there's two ways that you can do it. You can make a lump sum payment right when we give you the first payment, you can contact your lender and let them know that you wanna prepay with that $6,000. So depending on what your monthly payment is, if it's less than $6,000, you can say, I wanna take, you know, whatever it might be like, let's say prepaying for 12 months is only $5,000. Say, I wanna take $5,000, that's gonna be prepaying for the next 12 months. And then 
the, all those 12 payments will count for the PSLF, even though you're just making the one lump sum payment. You do have to contact them so that they know that's what you're intending to do. You can't just go online and make a $5,000 payment. They're just going to take that as one payment. So you do need to work with them um, and let them know that's what you want to do. Um, if that's the case, let's say, like I said, if it was $5,000, you'd still have to pay another $1,000 at some point within that contract year to get to that $6,000. Um, another thing you can do is if you just want to have a monthly payment and every month you're paying out of your checking or banking account, however you want to do it, as long as at the end of the contract year, those payments add up to $6,000, that is totally fine. All right. Um, I see we just have one more stack um, here. Um, so we'll take this last stack uh, from Chris Rubish and then we'll move on with our program since we're um, running a little short on time here. So go ahead, Chris. Thanks. I'll, I'll keep it really brief. Thank you, uh, Elizabeth, for the explainer. I, you know, really appreciate it and, you know, realize that we all have roles in the program and, you know, uh, your roles here to educate us today, and I appreciate that. I guess I would just ask if you could um, bring back to the Department of Health and the folks who were involved in the rulemaking process of this that I'm really discouraged. Um, I'm, I'm frankly discouraged. Why would I even bother to apply if I'm going to spend all this time and energy and get my hopes up that I'm going to have some ability to stay at the bedside and only mm -hmm. 200 of the 130,000 nurses in Minnesota are going to get anything Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm better off just applying somewhere else, uh, frankly. And, and, I, and I realize that's not your fault, but I just yeah. would ask that you bring that back to the, the, the people who did make this program. So uh, I think maybe Erin or Katie would be able to address that a little bit more. Um, we at MDH don't have a, um, a hand in what legislation, you know, is or isn't um, pushed, I guess to say. So um, we are part of the executive branch, so we will support the governor's um, bills and proposals. But beyond that, we do not determine funding amounts or, um, you know, I guess like who's eligible, who's not. So two things you can do is you can work with m &A and let them know that that's something that you think should be increased the funding. Um, or you can contact your local senators um, and House of Representative folks and let them know your concerns as well. Sometimes it's really powerful to hear from the constituents personally and let them know that that's really important to you and you, you just don't think that the funding is there and sure. enough. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm sure all of us uh, on the call will, will do that as well. So thank you. Yeah, great. Thank you. And it, just to add to what Rubish said, I think we just have some concerns overall about the purpose of this loan being about retaining nurses at the bedside, not serving underserved areas or other criteria that is available in other programs. We were only able to get 10 million allocated this year and to the nurses on the call, it's clear this is a need and we can continue to fight for more. But the way that this is being rolled out, I think our members just have some concerns and we would love to have further conversations about ensuring that as a, you're providing rulemaking and things like that, that it can be accessible for those who are in need because our nurses are leaving the bedside at high rates every single day and having a program that has penalties in place when there are concerns about completing the obligations and things like that. I think we're all just struggling a bit as we yeah. learn more and more about how the program is rolled out. Um, and Elizabeth, again, we know that's not on you. You didn't mm -hmm. make the rules. And it, we thank you so much for being here and for all your work and all your time. Um, but if you could share some of the concern that our nurses are bringing, we would really appreciate that because some of mm -hmm. this just doesn't work for people who have yeah huge workloads and intense amounts of moral injury because our hospitals aren't staffed appropriately. Understood, yes, thank you. I will do that. 